today in many churches the world over and i guess the ogs um guys you know the oratory of the good shepherd um in in many places the good shepherd good shepherd sunday is commemorated um especially in places like Isris, uh across the other side of the highway there the parish of the good shepherd and as i said the oratory of the good shepherd The Good Shepherd is a title that Jesus used for himself in this well-known section of the Gospel of John, in which he declares, in the pas- in the section that comes just before the passage I read for you, um, I am the Good Shepherd. It's one of seven great I am statements that appear in the Gospel of John. And I must confess, that as I was, as we were getting together in the chapel to pray, I was looking at the title that Sally had put into the pew leaflet, and suddenly nothing made sense. So I had to go and look at the lectionary in the prayer book. And um, if you were listening this time last year, you would have got the section before. And if you were listening the, this time the year before that, you would have got the first part of the Good Shepherd discourse. So I was a little bit thrown, because I'm thinking, does my sermon actually make sense? The passage set for today is so meaningful for the Christian understanding of who Jesus of Nazareth is, um, that parts of this particular gospel are appointed for this Sunday on all three years in the liturgical cycle of readings. I think it would be helpful. Um, there's a trouble with recording. I realize that I'm saying um too much. Um, <laughs> I think it would be helpful to begin by distinguishing between our understanding of what shepherds do and what the first reader's experience was of the work of shepherds. You must please remember that in terms of the social and economic structures of the days in which, during which this passage was actually written, shepherds, and you'll remember this from Christmas Eve, shepherds were ranked only slightly above that of lepers and beggars. They were dirty, they were filthy, and being a shepherd was a menial task. We tend to think of shepherds as herdsmen. And the difference is that we think of them walking behind the sheep and pushing these dumb animals forward. Come, 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 and shooing them forward. Yet, in terms of the biblical understanding of shepherds, and we're talking about the grubby, dirty young boys that were in the fields and that were treated like lepers and beggars, they actually led the sheep. They walked before the sheep and they called them and they would follow. There's a very big difference between our understanding of what a shepherd is and what the Bible's understanding of a shepherd is. It's important because we hear in Psalm 23 that the shepherd would lead them in right pathways. So hold that in your mind. And then we go into the background and implications of Jesus' claim to be the good shepherd in this whole of chapter 10 of John's Gospel. And the background makes it particularly consequential for our understanding of what we hear today. Throughout the Old Testament, but with special, special pointedness to the uh, prophetic books, The kings and other rulers of Israel and Judah are called shepherds. In fact, even if you go back to the Exodus, to when the Israelites were in in Egypt, Pharaoh was called a shepherd. The designation of shepherd makes sense 
because kings and rulers were entrusted with looking out for the welfare of God's people. They were responsible for defending them from attack. They were responsible for administering justice. They were responsible for taking care of the poor and the needy. They were responsible for making provisions for the worship of God. I am left wondering if our president, Jacob Zuma, fully understands this when in Melmoth, not yesterday but last Saturday, shortly after the debate in Parliament on his removal from office, says to the people there, as your president and shepherd, let me lead. Please, man. <laughs> That's my political soapbox for today. The Hebrew prophets made it very clear that the rulers of Israel and Judah failed on every count. My goodness, nothing's changed in a few thousand years. You see, the rulers and the kings of Israel and Judah, they fed themselves and not the flock. And they had scattered the sheep of the Lord's flock. They proclaimed the hope that the Lord would intervene on behalf of the people. God would be their true shepherd. God spoke to the prophet in Ezekiel chapter 34. And I'm going to uh, read from verse 12. And there's a promise there. I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on the day of clouds and thick darkness. And they will go after me all sing. Sorry, Sally, I have to do this. Majesty. Dear friends, throughout the Psalms, the Lord is presented as the shepherd of Israel, as the one who guides the people like a flock. The best known example that we can find of the Bible's shepherd imagery for God is the Psalm appointed for today, Psalm 23. So far, we have sung it in two different versions. We, I think we sing it in Crimin during the communion, right? I think so. The one that you're very familiar with. But most of you will know the psalm in one way or another, almost from your head. And if we say it, we won't have to open our prayer books and say, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. And so, in rich symbolism, the psalmist movingly depicts God as the true king of Israel and shepherd of God's people. God gives them everything they need. Nothing is missing from God's generous provision. There's sustenance, there's refreshment, there's beauty, there's safety. All of these are to be found among the Lord's gifts to God's people. The Lord's strength defends them from their oppressor and saves them from dangers the way a shepherd, in, those, in their understanding, protects their sheep from wolves, bears and lions. We hear the psalmist say, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They don't beat me into line. They comfort me. There's a difference. And then we hear that God's people rejoice because as they are surrounded by the abundance of God's love forever. 
And we hear the psalmist recognizing this in the words, Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Fellow members here, the understanding of God as the shepherd of Israel forms the foundation for Jesus' claim in the Gospel of John. Jesus begins what is known at the beginning of chapter 10, uh, what is known as the Good Shepherd Discourse by describing the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. God knows them by name, and they recognize God's voice. The relationship, dear friends, is direct and it is personal. God is not some far-off deity who is uninterested in God's people. God is certainly not the shepherd who is beating you from behind, but leading you forward. Because God loves them and calls them each by name. And so like the Old Testament prophets, Jesus contrasts the Lord's care for the people with the failure of the Jewish leaders who came before him. He exposes them as false, false shepherds. And instead of caring for the flock of God, they were thieves and robbers from whom the sheep needed protection and sustenance. Jesus insists that these false shepherds only came to kill, to rob, and to destroy. But he came to save the sheep and to give them abundant life. Jesus teaches that um, as Israel's true shepherd, the long-awaited Messiah, he knows us. He loves us. And he provides for us with the same knowledge, the same love, the same care that God, Israel's Lord, offers to God's people. He even promises us the gift of eternal and abundant life. By laying claim to the role of the Good Shepherd, Jesus is claiming for himself a position reserved for God alone. And this becomes evident in the section that we read from the Gospel today. The crowd demands, in the passage, demands that Jesus answer them clearly whether or not he is the Christ, whether or not he is the Messiah. And Jesus further angers them by telling them that they really ought to have discovered that for themselves when they had heard him teaching and when he had done signs before their eyes, in the face of empirical evidence, the people don't get it. And then, towards the end of the passage, we hear Jesus riling them even more by pressing the question further. He declares, the Father and I are one. In terms of that day, it was a remarkable statement, and if you carry on reading, it provoked a very dramatic response, and not the first time that people wanted to kill Jesus for what he said. They wanted to stone him. There appeared to be no two ways about it. Either Jesus was correct, or he was the, and he was the good shepherd being opposed by some outsider sheep. Or, on the other hand, he was a blasphemer who deserved the harassment, the, the, the harassment and the harshest kind of punishment that the law demanded. So the crowd's violent reaction illustrates the importance of the question that every single one of us faces. Who is this Jesus? Is he a blasphemer? Or is he who he says he is? Is this Jesus the Christ? 
Is he the good shepherd? I guess if Jesus came today, we'd probably put him in some asylum or something. In his book, Mere Christianity, um, C.S. Lewis suggested that one might ask if perhaps Jesus was simply a lunatic. But that no one who listened to Jesus' message about the care and the loving protection of God could seriously argue that Jesus was a madman. And therefore, instead of simply dismissing what Jesus says, C.S. Lewis tells us we must take his claims seriously. Many who first heard Jesus' claims to be one with God demanded evidence. They demanded signs that would demonstrate the truth of what he said. They wanted proof. And Jesus gave them an answer that when he declared, I am the good shepherd. That's in the passage just before the one I read. I know my own and my own know me and I lay down my life for the sheep. No one takes it from me but I lay it down for my own accord and I have power to take it up again. Dear friends, the proof that Jesus gives that he is the good shepherd is his loving sacrifice for the people of God and the power that we know in the resurrection. If we put it into different words, Good Friday and Easter morning are proof that Jesus of Nazareth is who he claims to be. So my dear friends, on this Good Shepherd Sunday, we ought to celebrate God's great love as it is revealed in Jesus Christ's total gift of himself and our behalf. He is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep and took it up again. And it is he who has given us the abundance of eternal life. As Christians, we receive this gift as we hear Jesus' voice calling us, each one of us by name, and as we trust him with our whole life in the knowledge that, commended to the Savior's keeping, we shall never, ever be ripped away from God's love. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.